Hello and thanks so much for joining us today. I'm Carol Jenkins. The program is Black America and I am so excited to introduce you to our guest today. My favorite person in the entire world, well maybe except for my children, mm -hmm. Deborah Santana. Thank you so much for being here. She's here with a brand new uh, book that she's edited and published called All the Women in My Family Sing. We're going to talk about that and a thousand other things that she does. Deborah, thank you so much for being yeah. with us today. And and tell us about deciding to do this collection of 69 women writers. Yes. <laughs> it started three years ago. Um, Nothing But The Truth Publishing was looking at all the statistics for women of color in publishing and saw that women of color are miserably represented in terms of the publishing industry. 79% of people working in publishing identify as white. 82% of the editorial staffs in publishing identify as white. So my friend said, will you publish an anthology all by women of color in terms of graphic design, PR, editing, all of the writers? And will you take that on? And I said, yes. Immediately. Yes. Right. <laughs> what a challenge, yeah, right? Well, I didn't realize. Well, but, fa <laughs> but faced with those numbers, and this is Christine? Christine Bronstein. Bronstein, yes. you yes. know, who, who is your partner in this publishing in, endeavor. So 60, you didn't know, did you know initially that it would be that many writers that you might, might be able to bring together under one, one cover? No, we sent out a call for submissions in different publications and websites and writers groups and received over 300 submissions and then had to edit and whittle it down to the final 69. And how did you do that? I know that, that I, sent it, I sent the notice to all of my friends saying, fabulous opportunity to be included in this anthology. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, send something to, you know, to, to Deborah. How did you make the final decision? Well, I actually had two women in the Bay Area who, one is a PhD professor and another is an avid reader. And they helped me read all of the essays and we talked over which ones we really believed in. We made a graph and a chart and we fought a little bit and got it down to the ones that were finally included. I, I would love to see that fighting, you know, Deborah, <laughs> Deborah Santana in a fight. Well, the subtitle is Women Write the World Essays on Equality, Justice, and Freedom. So mm -hmm. you, you were tr attempting to be fairly serious here in, in the kinds of subjects that the women would approach. The question was simply, what does it mean to be a woman of color in the world today? And that very broad question brought, as you can see, many different answers. And people focused on health, people focused on love, people focused on discrimination, racism, mm -hmm. families, illness. So I think it's indicative of where we stand ourselves. What is important to us? What, in what areas does racism affect us? In what areas are we involved in our vibrant lives. And so we got all these wonderful responses. Yeah, uh, and so I, I noticed that you say they're African American, Korean, LGBTQ, Native American, Asian American, uh, Cameroonian, Chicana, uh, South African. So from all of those various approaches, these women of color are writing about where they stand today. Mm -hmm. And the overall, I, I know that uh, I love it, because in my own family, uh, it resonated with this transition of what exactly do we call ourselves as African Americans? You know, we were Negro, we were colored, we were, and you have an essay. I mean, that's just, mm -hmm. you know, terrific on that whole evolution and who in the family accepts the designation. Mm -hmm. So it's those kinds of things that we get to revisit and uh, and learn about. Interestingly enough, in the editing process, we had great wrestling over capitalizing black, not capitalizing white, capitalizing brown. I mean, really, and each essay came in with its own designation in those areas. So we had to make a determination for people who self-identified as African-American or black. And of course, LaRonda Crosby Johnson, whose essay you're talking about, um, where she says we started off colored, <laughs> right? And we're, now we're and, colored, right? Yes, and then we went to Afro American, African American, Black, and uh, and all of the essayists had different designations for themselves. 
Right, right. And I noticed that you use Chicana, not so much the, the broader Latina right. designation. And that was after the big fight in the editing room. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, we could have used both. Right. So. Right, right. Well, you've got everybody. Uh, so let's talk about you because your definition of who you are, and we want, we might want to remind people that you were such a generous uh, participant in our special on the African American Museum uh, in D.C. You sit on the Smithsonian Institution board and are a lead donor for the African American Museum there, and we're in our um, more than a building uh, uh, special uh, on the making of that historic museum yes. that everybody is still flocking to. So you, you've, you talked with us then, so we know a little bit about your history. Uh, the black father, the English-Irish mom. So tell us a little bit about being biracial in America. Well, in the time that I was born in the 1950s, and San Francisco is my place of origin, which seems like a very liberal place, especially compared to the South or the Midwest, um, and yet I was definitely aware from the age of eight that I was different. And it happened when a young girl at my elementary school told me my mama was as white as day and my daddy was as black as night. Mm -hmm. And I thought, hmm. Wow. That's I, a frank description of, for an eight-year-old child to absorb. That. Yes. And until that point, I don't remember being aware that there, that there was anything different about us. But from that point forward, I was highly... Mm -hmm charged with understanding what was wrong with that because she'd said it with a sneer. Mm -hmm. So I knew there was something implicated that was wrong. Um, and yet our family was completely balanced and we didn't talk about racism in our you home. You had a happy, supportive family. Yes, we had mm -hmm. a blessed community. Mm -hmm. And um, my paternal grandparents, of course, started a church in Oakland, so we were raised with a very solid understanding that we were spiritual beings. And the Girl Scouts, you know, I mean, I had this very wholesome upbringing, and yet that racism was always sitting right here. Right, right. Well, I want you to know that my biracial grandchildren, twins, were just told in school this week by uh, one of their classmates that what the little boy said, my sister doesn't like brown skin, you know, and the girl of the twins stood right up and said to him, that was mean, not fair, not nice. Yes. <laughs> You're talking about my family, so it's still happening, mm -hmm. but at, at least now we think that children are prepared to fight back and to understand mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. they are just as worthy and just as, quote, good, mm -hmm. you know, as people with white skin. So, but it's a continuing fight. Yes, and that's the intention of the anthology, really. The intention is that everyone will read these stories and understand that, as I say in my foreword, 99 point, I think it's 0.7 percent of us in terms of our DNA is all the same. Mm -hmm. It is such a small portion that determines the skin color or the hair texture or the eye color. Um, and to create a life that is based on that very small difference is not healthy, nor is it progressive, and nor do we make any progress in our world, really. So the intention is for these women of color to tell their stories so that everyone will see how much alike we are, even though we have things that are different. And uh, one of the things that I've always been struck about you since uh, you know we met is your spirituality, the fact that you pursued just recently even a master's in spirituality. Um, we have a clip uh, of you talking a little bit about how you got to that place. Let's take a look at that now. How do we actually um, empower women and create change in a positive way? The effect of patriarchy is multi-layered. Somehow women have been oppressed by religion. We really want to rebalance the world and bring the sacred feminine forward. Justice, what does justice mean? What is truth? What is reality? What is right? What is wrong? We can reimagine it in a different way. Justice is our movement every day towards harmony and balance. Who I am has expanded. Um, my awareness, my spirituality, my intellect. It's such an emphasis on the experiential. How can we as women support one another in a way that honors 
like exactly and perfectly who we are. So the, so the last frame of that says, don't call me a girl or, or there, thereabouts. Um, that comes from the, the work that you're doing in that area of, of uh, teaching women spirituality uh, and that what your specialization was the matriarchal societies and what could be learned from re retracing those steps. Well, most of my awareness of the power of women comes from my mother. She was a feminist in the 60s, and she always believed in going to women doctors, having women professors, in the very powerful truth of women. And I think it is in my spirituality and in my master's, which was in philosophy and religion with a concentration in women's spirituality, um, was learning about the many, many <clears throat> cultures where matriarchal societies mm -hmm. promoted health. They were agrarian societies. They promoted equality. Everyone came to the matriarch to report. They lived in long houses in many places mm -hmm. in the world, and there was this ruling compassion and love, not competition and get out if you're not measuring up, but a way of compassionate support for the entire family. And I think that's what women do in our society now, or can do, of course, removing the current administration. Um, but <laughs> yes, women, as, a, as, a, as a side note. Yes, as, right, a, right. as a side note. Yes. Um, but if we are living our truth and our power and our light, we have the potential to heal. So uh, this book, uh, All the Women in My Family Sing, is the second one. The first is, uh, and this was my original copy when it first came out, Deborah Santana, Space Between the Stars, which was a fascinating uh, story, as you talk about it, as one of your lives, your first life. Or right. Second life, or, you know, at, yes. at least. And so yes. after this, you began your next life, which is extraordinary as a philanthropist. And this one was about your life with Carlos Santana, of course, and your children and, and that entire uh, music, fame, stardom, celebrity life. And uh, the next phase of your life was, was is the spiritual uh, phase of it, and you're starting a foundation, working with girls. Talk to us a little bit about the Do A Little Foundation that you started. Yes, so I had had the Malagro Foundation when I was married before, and it focused on health education and uh, for children and art for children. And then when I went on my own, I started Do A Little, which is based on what Archbishop Desmond Tutu said, do your little bit of good wherever you are. It's those little bits put together that overwhelm our world. And I decided to focus on women and women in the areas of art, health, and happiness. So education is really my foremost goal and hence the support I've given to the Daraja Academy, which you have also supported, yes, in Kenya. It's, yes, it's just terrific. Let's yeah. talk a little bit about that. We have a clip, actually, but tell us a little bit about how you got involved, and then we'll take a look at the clip. Great. So in 2008, uh, the found, one of the founders of Daraja, Jason Doherty, came to me with a very rudimentary video clip of these girls who had gone to elementary school in dirt floor huts and had very few... Um, books or pens Kenya, or paper, right. Yeah. right. Countryside, um, Kenya. Yes, and so he had this passion to start a secondary school for girls that would be completely supported so they would go to a boarding school where they were fed and clothed and were able to study and then they would have opportunities not formally given to them. And once I saw the video clip, I said, okay, I'm in. <laughs> <laughs> I love the way you commit. That's what's so fantastic. Yeah. You know, so you, you committed and then made a great film with our mutual friend, Barbara Rick, who's yes. an extraordinary filmmaker yes. and was nominated for an Emmy for her CBS work. Yes. Just, uh, just recently, too. Yes. But let's take a look at Daraja. <laughs>
a Kenyan perspective, so you're giving opportunity to girls who would otherwise not have this opportunity. Giving a girl who either get married or giving her a chance to see that there's life beyond poverty. Daraja means bridge in Swahili. And we see this school as a bridge from who the girls are now to who they can become. <laughs> oh, <Kate! laughs> How are you? Welcome to school. <laughs> I love those girls, I tell you. Every time I see their faces, it just makes me smile. What, what impact have you seen? It's changed you too. You say that from the minute you set foot uh, on that campus, you became a different person. Those girls now who are in that video, many of them have graduated from college. So for me, seeing them when they first came to Daraj as so shy, many of them, and from all over Kenya, they don't just take girls who are immediately by the campus. And they come from different walks of life, different experiences. In the past couple of years, they've accepted, I think, about five girls who are HIV positive. Mm -hmm. So the opportunities given to those young women and then to see them excel. Mm. And I think being an American, with we, all the opportunities we have, even if we have challenges, it's so different from being in a place where you have to choose to send one of your children to school. And in Kenya, generally it's sending the it's, boy, as it is boy. in most countries. Right. And to see these young women come and just seize the opportunity mm. and then transform themselves into leaders. Right. And I know you have a love for Africa. When we first met, it was the road to Ingwa Vuma, because I always struggle with that. But yes. that was when you uh, met with Nelson Mandela and mm -hmm. Bishop Tutu and mm -hmm. uh, Samuel Jackson went on this uh, trip with you mm -hmm. to South Africa. Talk, talk to us a little bit about that experience. And well, we were all board members of Artists for a New South Africa. Mm -hmm. And uh, the executive director, Sharon Gelman, had always led this march towards supporting the fight against apartheid. So we went in 2006 to South Africa and were able to sit at Nelson Mandela's feet. We went for Archbishop Tutu's 75th birthday, I think, at that time. So, yeah, what an honor. And, and, and it still replicates through the work that you do. I noticed that you quote, you know, Bishop Tutu and Nelson mm -hmm. Mandela mm -hmm. and as, as an example to men, you know, but, but who's... Uh, whose effects on women in the, in the world have been strong. Yes, and I'm, of course, so empowered by being able to watch those men and honor them and revere them. Um, and I'm, I'm, I, ha I bought a T-shirt for my husband, Carl Lumley, um, that says Girl Power. Ah. And he wears it very proudly. Right, right. But I think the emphasis, not only in the anthology, but in life, is women need to sit in a place of honor at all times. Not all women, of course, but we need to revere women. This patriarchal system of oppression that has been set up and that we all follow in this country has created the Me Too movement because men have not honored women. It's very basic. And in reality, there's so much that women now coming into our power, maybe some women don't want a man to open a door for her. We want to, you know, we, I can open the door myself. We're all so different. And so I understand that for men it's very confusing. But all they have to do is pay attention and follow us. Mm -hmm. And we will lead them to truth. We will lead them to the truth, mm -hmm. right? right? So that um, one of the things that we ask on our, on our Black America podcast is, we talk about the brink in Black America, mm -hmm. and women especially, um, where do you think we are in, uh, let's say we're on the brink, are we on the brink of fabulousness or disaster? You know, what's, what's your view of that? Well, I try to stay in the present. And I try to stay in a place of positivity and optimism because I think that we don't know the future. I do believe that we are on the brink of greatness. And I do believe that if we can receive economic parity, if we can get everyone out to vote, I believe we can have a beautiful society again in this country. 
Um, but we have to participate, and we have to own our power. Right, right. I just talked with Tarana Burke, who mm. you know, was the black woman mm -hmm. who started Me, Me too. too many, many years ago. Uh, mm -hmm. It's new resurgence by, by Alyssa Milano and the whole Hollywood yes. Me Too mm -hmm. and Time's Up and all of that. And what she said is what's not happening, even though money is being generated for courts, money is not being generated at the same rate for women and boys and girls who need help. In other words, the counseling, the treatment mm -hmm. centers, the, mm -hmm. all of that, a space to meet and to talk to, mm -hmm. through their problems. And so how do, how do we change that paradigm where, you know, we've gotten into a very high level Me Too, Time's Up kind of concept mm -hmm. and not with the people who are actually suffering? We can only work where we are. It's that old saying, bloom where you're planted. We have to find the resources within our own communities and everybody has to participate. We can't sit back and think that someone else is going to do it. And that's part of my mission, of course, with Do A Little, is if I am brought something that I can do, um, either something for children or for women, then I want to participate in that. And I do believe that I mean, just the fact that Tarana Burke is finally getting her due her credit, right? Yes, right. for starting the movement um, is so significant. But all of us have to participate. And she was working when she didn't have any Precisely. recognition. Precisely. So that we aren't doing it for recognition. And I think that's something that um, is lost also if when things come out of Hollywood. Um, every there are so many people who are working daily to make progress and change, purposeful change in our society. Um, and if we don't know about it, doesn't mean it isn't happening. You, in your personal life, uh, have three gorgeous, talented children that, that you're, you describe yourself, too, as something of a manager of, of their careers in a more professional, all mothers think, you know, I'm managing my children's careers, too, but you in a very specific <laughs> business-like business-like way. Talk to us about your kids following mostly in the music business. Um, the older two. So actually my role has changed. They yeah. have all pretty much released me from any managerial roles, <laughs> which is perfect. I hope that was a pleasant release. Yes, yes, <laughs> yes. yes. Well, they're capable and yes. I was just in that role and I need to release it. But Salvador, who's 34, of course, has his music that is very profound and he's always working as a musician. He will have something coming out with Astro Sierra pretty soon mm -hmm. of Ozo Motley. He's worked on an album with him and then there's Stella um, in the middle. Yeah, Stella, tell us. We have actually have a clip of Stella whose yes. uh, singing career is bursting forth. Let's, yes. Let's take a listen to Stella. Okay. I'm sorry. Love it, love it. That's a that's a star in the in the making. I say yes. more than in the making. She's really, yes. You know, she's, talk to us, to us about where she is now. Well, she. I think Stella wants to get a record deal. She mm -hmm. wants to do the recording route that way. Salvador, I think, is going to stay more independent. I'm mm -hmm. not sure, um, but they both are very prolific in their music. And Stella's a shapeshifter. You know, she's gorgeous. She does the modeling. She wears the clothes. She can. <laughs> She's, she's very powerful. Right. And then Angelica, the youngest, uh, who lives in the San Francisco Bay Area, mm -hmm. actually was the associate producer on the Dolores Huerta film. Ah. And so she has been in filmmaking. She's also a graphic artist and a writer. Right, right. And of course we love, we always say, if you get to see Dolores, uh, by all means see it. It's a fantastic documentary. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, talk about an activist. That's my granddaughter took a picture with Dolores, and that is like sitting up on her dresser. Yes, <laughs> you know, yes. This is me when I grow up. I'm going to yes. be Dolores Huerta. <laughs> yes. yes. Um, 
we always ask our guests as the uh, close of the program is uh, approaching uh, to finish the statement, the power of the strength of black America lies in what, and you know us, so you know we ask this question. Yes, <laughs> yes. What do you think in this day, in 2018? Yes, yes. I think the power lies in our stories, just as it does in the anthology, All the Women in My Family Sing. We have beautiful, fabulous stories, and just as we see them in the National Museum of African American History and Culture, a history that has not been told, and people need to understand who we are as a people. They need to understand our accomplishments and our contributions to the building of this country, as well as being able to be powerful leaders moving forward. And you are working on another memoir? I was. <laughs> Really? You gave yes. it up? You're too busy doing other things? And here I am waiting for any day yes. for it to show up yes. uh, so that I can go by it. I want to know, I want to know the, next, yes. the next chapters of the Deborah Santana life story. It's compelling. It's exciting. Mm, thank you. I've written a few different versions, um, and I've put them all away in a box because I... I don't really want to promote myself right now. That's why I really love this anthology. I want to promote all women's voices. I really want to promote the harmony and the healing of our country and our world. And that's sort of enough because it doesn't seem that we're moving in a healing path. But I do believe that if we're going to survive, we need to heal. Well, thank you so much, Deborah. We honor that decision and we'll wait for the memoir to come out after you've changed the world, inspired us so much. Thank you so much, Deborah Santana. Thank you. The, the name of the anthology is All of the Women in My Family Sing. It is tremendous. Go out and buy it, order it today. It's fantastic. Thank you so much uh, to Deborah and also to you out there for watching us today. I'm Carol Jenkins. The program is Black America. <laughs>